This hearing will come to order. I want to uh, welcome our distinguished guests and uh, visitors here to the first of two research and science education subcommittee hearings dedicated to the development of legislation to reauthorize programs at the National Science Foundation. Today we'll hear from the distinguished director of the National Science Foundation and the chair of the National Science Board. Next week we will hear from a diverse panel of outside witnesses who will weigh in on some of the broader issues we hope to address through this legislation, including support for young investigators, NSF's important role in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM education, the industry's role in supporting basic research, and the future of interdisciplinary research. As part of our hearing today, I hope we'll look at the issue of young investigators. In fiscal year 2006, new investigators achieved an 18 percent funding success rate compared to a returning investigator success rate of 30 percent and an overall agency rate of 25 percent. I know that NSF is making it a priority to narrow this gap and that it supports outstanding young investigators through the very prestigious Career Grants Program. However, I also believe that more can be done to nurture and support new researchers and that we need to be creative in figuring out ways to keep bright young researchers in the pipeline. For this reason, the committee is considering creating a new pilot program of seed grants to new investigators to give them an opportunity to strengthen their proposals before resubmitting them through the merit review process. Another topic of particular interest to us this today is industry's role in funding basic research. There are leaders in high-tech industry that understand that their future depends in large part on the scientific advances made by researchers in university labs across the country. Unfortunately, however, many in industry fail to see or ignore the potential for university industry partnerships to further their own success and competitiveness. NSF can play a significant role in changing attitudes and fostering partnerships by providing incentives to both university researchers and private sector officials to bridge this divide and encourage participation in research. This committee is also quite concerned about the slow growth and in some cases shrinking budget of STEM education programs at NSF. Chairman Gordon has introduced legislation to strengthen and broaden existing K-12 STEM education programs at NSF, in particular NOICE Teacher Scholarship Program, the Math and Science Partnership, and the STEM Talent Expansion Program. Today I'd like to spend time discussing STEM's, or NSF's role in STEM education, including technological training at two-year colleges through the Advanced Technological Education Program. And I might interject also that I'm very grateful for Dr. Cora Merritt at visiting my district last week and meeting with a number of educational leaders throughout the spectrum. Dr. Merritt, it was a pleasure to have you out there, and I'm glad you managed to, to uh, get home in spite of the travel difficulties. Today I also hope that we will explore the concept of interdisciplinary research. The frontiers of 21st century science are very much dominated by what most would consider to be interdisciplinary research, research conducted by teams of scientists that integrate information, data, methods, perspectives, and theories from two or more bodies of specialized knowledge to advance fundamental understanding or solve problems beyond the scope of a single discipline. Without compromising the strength of the individual discipline or the ability of the lone scientist to make great advances on narrow topics within his or her own field, we need to also make sure that interdisciplinary proposals get a fair hearing. NSF sh has shown a great leadership on this issue, but I believe there are ways to better define this process and look forward to ongoing discussions with the agency and the community on ways to go about this. I should add that many of these issues we, that we must deal with in the context of NSF reauthorization are issues that the greater community is also grappling with. However, because NSF funds 20 percent of basic research at the U.S. colleges and universities across all science and engineering disciplines, and because NSF continues to be at the forefront of the ever-evolving scientific enterprise, they are issues of particular importance to me, to this subcommittee, and to the NSF. In addition to some of these broad issues, we'll take a look today at some specific budget and administrative issues at the Foundation, some of which are longstanding issues of concern, and others of which have been brought to the attention of the committee more recently. I want to note this committee supports the administration's proposal to double funding for basic science research over a 10-year period, and the authorization levels that we will propose are aligned with the administration's plans. However, I also want to suggest that we can't afford to keep playing this game of increasing funding for one set of disciplines while decreasing or flatlining funding of others. We will continue to advocate for increased fundings for basic and applied research across the board, but we need help from the entire scientific community in justifying such increases to the rest of our colleagues in Congress and to the American taxpayer as well. We must also recognize these are tight budget times. 
We can't simply throw money at science because we want to. We need to maintain diligence in ensuring that research we fund is of top quality, that federally funded researchers are held to the highest standards of ethical conduct of research, and that we are thoughtful in setting priorities for research funding. Finally, I want to be clear that the process for developing NSF reauthorization bill is to be open, transparent, and responsive to all concerned parties, both within and outside the government. I welcome your suggestions and encourage you to be in touch with me uh, with your thoughts or ideas, and that's the broad you, not just our witnesses today, but others in the, if they're here in the audience or in the scientific community. We welcome their feedback and their suggestions. Dr. Bement, Dr. Beering, thank you for being here with us today. I look forward to hearing your testimony, to receiving your input and guidance as we develop this NSF reauthorization legislation. And thank you both for your leadership on the uh, foundation and the board. And I now yield to my colleague, Ranking Member Ehlers, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here, representing one of the finest institutions in the federal government, and perhaps the finest. Uh, you will find this to be a friendly committee, I'm sure, uh, certainly more friendly than much of the rest of the, uh, the Congress. Not that anyone dislikes you, but they, they all say they like you, but don't provide money for you. <laughs> uh, we will continue to try to do what we can, to not only like you, but provide money for you. I am pleased to participate in the Research and Science Education Subcommittee's first hearing of this Congress to address the reauthorization of the National Science Foundation. The goals of reauthorization are to improve the functioning of an agency known for both high caliber research output and internal efficiency, which makes our job somewhat more challenging than trying to prove upon an agency with glaring shortcomings. Finding areas in need of improvement can be best achieved from hearing from expert witnesses like those before us today. And the NSF consumers who will testify at the end of the month in a second hearing. In finding areas for strengthening and improvement, I believe we must remain cognizant of the uniqueness of the National Science Foundation. What goes for other agencies may not necessarily apply to NSF. I know the committee is interested in exploring some of the relationships the National Science Foundation has established with industry, and I am keenly interested in, in encouraging these relationships while maintaining the quality of NSF fundamental research. As current researchers know, potential applications are important, but should not dictate research design exclusively. Chairman Baird and I share concerns in several areas of NSF, including maintaining the integrity and capacity of the peer review process, managing increasingly interdisciplinary research portfolios, and educating our future workforce in all STEM-related jobs, not just those historically identified as science and engineering careers. Finally, I look forward to hearing about NSF's preparations for future funding increases that this committee has worked tirelessly to authorize and ultimately see supported through the appropriations process. And I certainly also share the chairman's concern about the young scientists and certainly encouraging them so that they can get their, uh, their feet in the door, uh, begin their tenure track before they lose their position for lack of funding of their research. I thank Dr. Mehmet and Dr. Beering for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. If there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record. At this time, I'd like to introduce our two witnesses. <laughs> Dr. Arden Bement is director of the National Science Foundation. He became the director in 2004 after having served more than two years as director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Dr. Stephen Beering is the chair of the National Science Board. He has served on the board since 2002, was elected chairman in 2006. Before retiring in 2000, he served for 17 years as president of Purdue University in Indiana. As our witnesses both know well, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. And we will start with Dr. Bement again. Thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. Uh, chairman Bar Baird, uh, Ranking Member Ehlers, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. You've raised a number of important issues in our, your invitation letter, and I commend you both for taking an active role in promoting a discussion of these questions. Before I address some of your specific questions, I want to let you know how much I appreciate your strong statements of support for our fiscal year 2008 budget request. 
As you know, the request will provide an 8.7 percent increase over the continuing resolution. Funding at this level will keep NSF on the course set by the President's American Competitiveness Initiative to drive innovation and sharpen America's competitive edge. Let me move on to the specific issues you've raised. Uh, the first is in regard to NSF's efforts to uh, nurture young investigators. We take this responsibility very seriously and address it in a variety of ways. Our signature faculty early career development program called CAREER is our most prestigious award in support of the early career development of young investigators. Successful applicants must effectively integrate research and education within the context of their organization's mission. NSF provides 400 new career awards annually, each for a duration of five years to some of the best and brightest young researchers in the country. Each year, NSF nominees uh, nominates the most meritorious new career awardees for the Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers, called PCASE. This presidential award is the nation's highest honor bestowed on scientists and engineers beginning their careers. NSF also engages in a variety of outreach efforts to support and nurture young investigators. Our NSF Days program provides workshops to assist investigators in understanding the process of submitting proposals to NSF. Over the past five years, we have sponsored 40 workshops and that have attracted nearly 6,000 participants. Additional outreach efforts pair NSF program officers with researchers whose proposals have been declined in an effort to improve proposals for re uh, subsequent resubmission. The effectiveness of these efforts is shown by the fact that the share of grants to new investigators has remained stable of, at about 28 percent over the past decade, although the overall success rate has declined from around 30 percent to 21 percent. In that same period, the proportion of grant grantees receiving an award within seven years of their last degree has also remained stable at about 74 percent. Let me quickly move on to the matter of an appropriate balance between interdisciplinary and disciplinary research. Support for interdisciplinary research is a priority for the NSF because it presents a tremendous opportunity for innovation. Finding the proper balance results from discussions with the National Science Board and through feedback from our many stakeholders. NSF's, uh, NSF centers and the priority areas outlined in our budget also serve as catalysts for generating interdisciplinary proposals. We continually make a strong effort to communicate our interest in supporting interdisciplinary research. The flexibility of NSF's merit review process allows program officers to use multiple approaches to meet the challenge of reviewing interdisciplinary proposals. In some cases, male reviews are used to provide deep expertise on various aspects of proposals. Panel reviews are often used to integrate reviews from different disciplinary perspectives and to provide a broader interdisciplinary overview. Recognizing interdisciplinary proposals poses little difficulty especially when they are submitted in response to a specific solicitation. Fastlane, our electronic grant application process, also gives PIs an opportunity to select multiple programs to consider their proposal. In fiscal year 2004, the National Science Board initiated a task force on transformative research, and a planning document generated by this task force is currently under review. A key concern of this effort is stimulating interdisciplinarity. That is, transformative research while maintaining the balance with disciplinary research. Ultimately, this issue can only be addressed through continuous feedback between NSF and the scientific community. Maintaining this balance is central to our role as stewards of the U.S. scientific and engineering enterprise. Let me move on to the matter of how NSF focuses attention to research issues of national importance. To meet the research challenges that rise to national significance, NSF relies on input from many sources, reports from the National Academies, R&D guidance as presented by the OSTP OMB Priorities Memo and the National Science Board, presidential priorities such as the American Competitiveness Initiative, congressional interest, and our extensive interaction with the research community. NSF research priorities are evaluated by on a continuous basis by our advisory committees, committees of visitors, and scientific conferences, strategic plans, and so forth. 
By funding collaborative grants and cooperative agreements, NSF can foster partnerships with academia and industry, potentially expediting the transition of basic research to products. NSF center programs engage directly in encouraging industry and university partnerships. But perhaps NSF's most effective partnership with industry is our support of undergraduate and graduate students who enter the private sector armed with the latest understanding of advances in science and engineering fields. Mr. Chairman, the issues you have raised in this hearing are of profound importance, not only to NSF, but to the nation. They are not easy matters, nor do they lend themselves to simplistic or formulaic solutions. But I look forward to working with you on these issues and would be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Bement. And I'm, I'm painfully aware that for something as complicated as, as NSF and the, and the related board, five minutes introductory statement is not nearly enough. <laughs> but please rest assured we'll give you plenty of time through the Q&A to elaborate on some of the very, very uh, salient points you made. Thank Dr. You. Beering. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. I'm the President Emeritus of Purdue University, and I'm privileged to be here with Arden B. Ment, uh, with whom I've worked for the past 15 years, both at Purdue and at the National Science Foundation. This is my first time to testify before you as Chairman of the National Science Board, a position to which I was elected in May 06, and I'm indeed honored to be with you. Congress established the National Science Board in 1950 and gave it dual responsibilities. To guide the activities of and establish the policies for the National Science Foundation and to serve as an independent advisory body to the President and the Congress on national policy issues related to science and engineering research and education. On behalf of the entire board and the widespread and diverse research and education communities that we all serve, I thank the members of this subcommittee for your long-term support of a broad portfolio of investments in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics research and education. Your continuing bipartisan commitment to excellence in U.S. science and engineering research and education has ensured that the U.S. remains a leader in global innovation and discovery. My complete written testimony has already been submitted to you for the record. Let me now briefly address the questions Chairman Barrett raised in his letter of March 7. First, what can NSF do to nurture young investigators and to improve their funding rates? This is a major and ongoing concern for the Board. In our December 03 report to Congress that responded to Section 22 of the last NSF Authorization Act, we identified the need of an additional $1 billion over the five-year period of 02 to 07 to fund more grants generally, and $200 million to fund an expansion of the institutions of higher education participating <laughs> in NSF activities, including funding for startup awards to new PhDs at those institutions. New PhDs just starting their academic careers, no matter how excellent the academic record, are less likely to be employed by top-tier institutions and more likely to start their careers and primarily teaching situations. Expanding research in these institutions therefore opens doors for new PhDs to build careers in research. We also support the expansion of the NSF career, faculty early career, and similar programs, coupled with general expansion of funding for basic research, also called for by the American Competitiveness Initiative and the National Academies report rising above the gathering storm. The NSF authorization of 02 included a welcome authority to double the budget over a five-year period to nearly $10 billion in 07. The actual 07 budget of approximately $6 billion represents a significant gap with the 02 authorization. The American Competitiveness Initiative again calls for a doubling of the NSF budget over a 10-year period. We would respectfully suggest that the time to implement these admirable authorizations and initiatives has never been more urgent than now. Your second series of questions regarding NSF funding for interdisciplinary research focused on the appropriate balance between funding for interdisciplinary and disciplinary research, best mechanisms for soliciting and funding interdisciplinary research proposals, and the sufficiency of publicizing interdisciplinary research funding opportunities at NSF. This is another area to which NSF and the Board 
have given considerable attention and resources. Nonetheless, there remain substantial issues to assure that interdisciplinary research is not disadvantaged in the highly competitive NSF merit review system or in the academic sector by structural impediments. NF NSF has taken a number of steps over a long period of time to ensure that the level of investment and mechanisms of support address structural roadblocks to funding interdisciplinary research. For example, NSF supports nearly 100 centers in part to provide greater opportunities for and encourage interdisciplinary research. The most recent board guidance to NSF on balance between centers and individual investigator awards establishes a six to eight percent of the R&RA budget as an appropriate level to support centers. With respect to publicizing opportunities for interdisciplinary research, I should point out that most research proposals submitted to NSF are unsolicited, and that is a good thing for the health of U.S. research. To a great extent, this enables the research community to self-identify and establish a balance between disciplinary and interdisciplinary work on the basis of opportunities for discovery and the quality of the research proposals submitted. However, it is also important to ensure that researchers are knowledgeable about all NSF funding opportunities and the process for obtaining that funding and further that the review process is fair and results in the best use of scarce funding to fund cutting edge research. You also ask about the NSF role in research driven by national needs and fostering university industry partnerships and the application of criterion two, which encourages partnerships of the NSF merit review process with regard to national needs. NSF's mission is defined in the NSF Act in terms of national needs, and such needs, both broadly and narrowly defined, have always shaped the portfolio of our investments. The board established criterion two of the merit review system in part to enhance partnerships, potential benefits to society, and contributions to innovation. Further, NSF has long participated in interagency R&D priorities most recently including the National Nanotechnology Initiative, Climate Change Science Program, Networking and Information Technology R&D, and Homeland Security. Moreover, NSF center programs often explicitly require partnering with industry. In addition, NSF funds small business innovation research and cross-agency and cross-sectoral research programs in such areas as earthquake science and engineering and research in the polar regions. The board has also recently published a report recommending a new national hurricane research initiative that cuts across fields of science, suggests a co-lead role for NSF and NOAA, and includes a number of additional agencies as major players. Your final question concerns NSF's priorities in K-16 science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so-called STEM education, and how the current budget reflects those priorities, especially NSF's role in undergraduate education. The board has been especially concerned with this major area of NSF's responsibility, education in science, technology, engineering, and math. Education is a core mission of NSF. Even while U.S. student performance in mathematics and science is declining relatively uh, as assessed internationally, Changing workforce requirements mean that new workers will need ever more sophisticated skills in STEM disciplines. Following a request from Congress, the board established a new advisory commission on 21st century education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in March of 06, comprising a wide range of eminent experts representing the broad scope of interests in U.S. STEM education. We have charged that commission to examine and advise us on the role of NSF in both pre-college and undergraduate education as part of its activities. Moreover, the board is expecting shortly to receive the report of our Education and Human Resources Committee on engineering education reform, primarily at the undergraduate level. We expect that following our board meeting next week, when we will receive advice from our STEM Education Commission and over the next few months with the work of the Board's Education and Human Resources Committee evaluating assessments of NSF education programs, 
we will develop new guidance to the foundation on its priorities for education programs at the undergraduate and pre-college levels. Following our board meeting next week, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with individual members of your committee and others in the Congress and the administration to discuss the board's national action plan for addressing our nation's STEM education needs. The federal investment in the nation's science and technology is a necessity for our future prosperity and security. To quote a recent editorial by Microsoft founder Bill Gates in the Washington Post, if the United States is to remain a global economic leader, we must foster an environment that enables a new generation to dream up innovations. As other nations ramp up their investment in the infrastructure for research and innovation, we cannot be complacent. I've just returned this past week from the European Union's Congress, and I am absolutely impressed and astounded at the progress of those 27 nations. We must sustain the advantages that we have gained through continued wise, adequate federal support for our science and engineering research and education enterprise. The National Science Foundation is a key asset to our nation, having proven itself effective in stimulating discovery and innovation for now over half a century, working in partnership with the research and higher education communities. The board is committed to working with you to assure that limited federal funding resources are optimally invested through the National Science Foundation to sustain U.S. leadership in science and technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Beering. I, uh We'll take you up on the offer to get together to discuss the, the STEM education study you've come up with. And uh, you know, Dr. Ehlers and I and other members of the committee who are interested, I'm sure we'll find a time to do that as it's of critical importance. I also see a president in our audience, a number of, uh, of the ADs for the various science directorates we met with last week. Good to see all of you folks. Uh, thanks for being here and for your work and also staff from uh, the science board as well. We appreciate the work of, of the staff. At this point, we'll open up uh, our first round of questions. Uh, the chair would recommend, uh, recognize himself for five minutes. And uh, related to the issue of staff that I just raised, one of my first questions would be, as we talk about uh, the idea of possibly doubling the budget, which I hope we'll do <coughs> over the next several years, that will carry with it uh, some administrative needs, including workforce, infrastructure, and travel. Uh, if we just expand the number of research grants, but we don't expand the infrastructure necessary to manage those grants, it seems to me we'll be in some trouble. I'd open it up to either of you to uh, address that issue and any thoughts you have about how it needs to be addressed. Yes, thank you. And thank you for uh, calling attention to an item that is absolutely critical to the uh, quality of our work. Uh, many of the opportunities that the Foundation uh, faces right now that has to do with uh, mentoring young investigators that has to do with uh, um, our post-award and pre-award oversight activities as well as uh, maintaining quality of our uh, merit uh, review process is dependent entirely on our program officers and program directors. At the present time, they're chronically overworked. Um, I worry that uh, they may not be picking up the uh, transformative research opportunities for a lack of time to really dig into some of the good proposals that they're, they're getting. Uh, that has to be rectified, but in addition to that, we need to maintain our investments in uh, productivity enhancing tools, both electronic and otherwise, that uh, take some of the workload uh, off our, um, our staff. Uh, travel is important because you can't do post-award oversight unless you can get out and visit the investigators, either at meetings where they congregate or at their uh, home research laboratories. Um, all these taken together, plus uh, issues of cybersecurity, uh, modernizing our information uh, technology within the foundation, fall under our uh, agency operations and um, award management uh, budget line. And I would uh, urge in uh, reauthorization that uh, that be included as a major priority. And I would also uh, very much welcome your advocacy to be sure that we get full funding this year in our 08 request. 
I appreciate that. I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, oftentimes when the appropriation season comes around and we look for offsets, we tend to say, well, we'll go after the administrative line. But the administrative personnel are necessary to make the system work, and not only just the personnel, but as you say, the travel, the equipment, the resources. And it's just not responsible or realistic to say we're going to plus up one side and not give the resources to sustain that. So we will make that a right. priority. Thank you. Uh, secondly, I, uh, I'm intrigued by the process, and, and it's, it's a discussion that would probably extend well beyond the today, but the process by which uh, the board and the foundation determine where the resources will go and uh, uh, what percentage of the dollars uh, and what total amount of dollars will go to one uh, uh, directorate versus another or one enterprise within a directorate versus another. Let me throw out a, a thought that occurred to me the other day. Uh, quite understandably, I think, when you look at, say, the big super colliders and giant telescopes, a tremendous amount of money is going to those and they're expensive installations. But as I look at, at some of the greatest national challenges we're going to face in the next several decades, I would say if you, if you, one would be the war on uh, terror and the conf, uh, national security issue. A second would be clearly energy. A third would be rising health care costs, et cetera. As I look at those, a portion of those will be addressed uh, by the, uh, the traditional physical, biological, and other sciences. But behavior, human behavior, it's going to have a great deal to do. In fact, if we wanted to truly address our energy crisis in the most immediate way possible, it would not be through cellulosic ethanol or, for God's sakes, nuclear fusion, which is a little ways off, to say the least. It would be by everybody driving less and carpooling and using mass transit. And if we did that, we could cut energy consumption by 10 percent. I raise that to ask, do we need some grand challenges in the social sciences or grand social challenges to which we would apply the social sciences in addition to the other sciences, and how might that be considered by the foundation or the board in the coming years? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. Uh, there's no question, but uh, uh, the, the human uh, uh, component in all of our research is uh, increasing because of the increasing complexity of the research. Uh, you mentioned interdisciplinarity. Uh, in many of our interdisciplinary programs, the social sciences are uh, social scientists are a full partner. Uh, grand challenges are important because uh, the cost of doing research in the social sciences is going up because of increasing um, uh, complexity and size of databases and uh, the kind of research that uh, they need to do in, in trying to analyze uh, those type of um, data with advanced uh, cyber infrastructure. Uh, so I fully agree that we, uh, we do have to give appropriate emphasis to the social sciences. We have to integrate them with all our, our other major programs, and the grand challenge idea is a good one. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield uh, Mr. Dick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Bering, you made some comments about what you would like to see in the reauthorization language. Uh, Dr. Bement, I'm wondering if there is anything specific you would like to uh, request as we reauthorize, other than saying you want all the money and no, con no control, but. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> uh, flexibility is important, and uh, <laughs> lack of uh, prescriptive language, that would be very helpful. Um, I think the most important need I've already discussed as far as our agency operation and award management account, uh, I think that deserves special notice in the uh, reauthorization bill. Uh, a very minor element, we do have the Waterman Award, which uh, honors the first director of the foundation. And each year we try to select one from many disciplines and, and, and many outstanding candidates. I continually get um, a request from the excellent committee we have that goes th through the screening process and has a very difficult time, that this may be the time to increase it to three. So I would put that before the, uh, the committee as, as a component of the bill. Uh, let me ask both of you, you've seen draft language of what's being proposed. Are there any parts that you particularly like and more importantly, any parts you don't like? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Could you be a little more specific? 
Well, I got uh, a large number of notes that I would uh, like to present for the record, but uh, clearly um, uh, under the uh, major research instrumentation section, which is section three, part D, we have just increased the ceiling to $4 million, and we've also increased the, um, uh, the funding in the, in the 08 request to $114 million. We don't know yet what the skew will be of that distribution and who we may be disadvantaging in, in the lower uh, cost instrumentation uh, across our constituency, and especially in some of the uh, uh, minority serving institutions and um, EPSCOR institutions. Uh, my recommendation there is to uh, uh, increase the ceiling stepwise as we increase the budget rather than to uh, raise the ceiling so high that one or two awards would, uh, would uh, greatly disadvantage uh, a larger number of uh, applicants for important uh, equipment. Um, I think uh, the thing uh, that Section Five is um, is a good um, a good section as far as interdisciplinary research. We've already addressed that. Uh, there's always always more that we can do, but invariably it deals with the uh, the nature of the science question that needs to be addressed and how the, uh, the community responds to that. So as a bottom up organization, we really can't. Uh, define all the opportunities for interdisciplinarity, but we certainly encourage it. We've been at this now for 25 years, and finally the universities are getting religion, <laughs> and they've begun to uh, reduce the, uh, the silos a little bit. So in our unsolicited proposals, we're seeing a, an increasing fraction, and now it's up to anywhere from 40 to perhaps 50%. Uh, there are multiple PI, and many of those are interdisciplinary, but they're unsolicited. And I could go on. There's, there's much more in here. Well, we'd certainly appreciate having that for the record. Dr. Beering, any comments you wish to make? Yeah, we addressed uh, that issue and, and others in my written testimony, starting on page 14. And we also addressed it uh, in a previous hearing on March the 20th. But let me comment uh, specifically on your section six on new investigators. Uh, we are struggling with how we can get transformative research front and center in our endeavors. And I think this uh, uh, new section here is going to be helpful in that regard. And then section 11 on STEM education is very vital. Uh, I expect that our STEM education report is going to recommend some specific action plans, uh, one of which is to increase the length of the school year as you compare ourselves with Asia and Europe. It's astounding. Uh, how much more time their students spent in class and formal instruction than ours do, and some of the requirements they have for science and language, which we do not have. So I would uh, highlight those two items as extremely helpful. Dr. Biment. If I may bring up uh, one other uh, section that I think is uh, critically important, and that's section 12 on cost sharing. Uh, let me first emphasize that we accept cost sharing. <laughs> In fact, we encourage it. We just don't require it. And the reason we don't require it is that there are many uh, institutions and many investigators that can't get a cost share, especially, uh, again, among minority serving institutions and um, some EPSCOR uh, states, for example. Uh, to put it in as a requirement disadvantages them from even being able to uh, submit a proposal. And I think that's wrong. Uh, I think we should continue to encourage cost share, but we should not uh, mandate it. Thank you both. I see my time has expired. Doctor, well, I was missing. Oh, there it's Dr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. Appreciate very much you uh, you being here. I have two uh, issues I'd like to pursue. Uh, one is the uh, huge problem that we face in this country in. Uh, uh, two dialogues, major dialogues that we're having in agreement on the facts. It's very difficult to have a, uh, an intelligent conversation if you can't agree on the facts. Of course, we're all in, uh, privileged to have our own interpretations, but we shouldn't have our own facts. The two areas that I'm thinking of, one of them is climate change and, and global warming. 
And to whom should we turn? Your organizations are certainly among those. To whom should we turn as an honest broker so that we can have some agreed upon facts for this discussion? Well, Dr. Bartlett, it's, um, it's good that you brought up that question because I just came from Dartmouth University where we had all the Arctic nations come together and discuss that for about three days. Uh, the evidence is clear. Um, there is climate change. There is global warming. There are anthropogenic effects. We need to understand the, uh, the extent of uh, those types of effects. The, um, the trends are not looking good. In fact, they may not be linear. In fact, I suspect they're, they're not linear. They can become autocatalytic over time. So you just can't take what's happened in the past and project it uh, very, very comfortably into the future. Uh, I think it's a, it's a global problem that will require global approaches to research and global approaches to, um, to mitigation. To whom do we turn for some agreement on what the facts are so that we can have an intelligent conversation? Another area that's very important is the energy area and, 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 and peak oil. And if, in fact, we have reached, uh, as many people believe we have, the maximum pro capability of the Earth for producing oil from conventional sources, then we in the United States, particularly in the world in general, faces a very uncertain future. Well, I would, I would recommend you turn to the National Science Foundation. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't fetter uh, any of our staff or any of our uh, 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 grantees in, in taking an open stance on any issue. Um, in fact, we have requirements in our uh, grant manual that uh, requires open sharing and, uh, and open uh, publication and an open discussion of issues. So that goes on all the time, and um, uh, certainly we would welcome any uh, questions you have on any of those issues. And, and, and certainly working with the uh, National Science Board, that's an ideal place to uh, raise some of those issues. As an example of one of the areas, and you mentioned the cellulosic uh, ethanol, there's now a lot of hype about uh, cellulosic uh, ethanol. A, a speech was given by Hyman Rick over 50 years ago, the 15th day of this May, to a group of physicians at St. Paul, Minnesota. And in that, he noted that um, uh, the time would come when we, needed, when we would have to change from fossil fuels to renewables and that there would then be a, con a tension between food and energy. And we've seen that tension in, in corn ethanol. We produce relatively trifling amounts of ethanol from corn, but we've doubled the price of corn, and tortillas have gone up so that poor Mexicans can hardly afford to buy them. And our, our dairy industry is dying now because of the increased price of, of corn. So now we're turning to cellulosic ethanol, but Hyman Rickover also noted that there was going to be a tension between energy and soil fertility. What is the potential for cellulosic ethanol? To whom should we return for a rational analysis of this? Because now there's a lot of what I, I think it, it is unrational exuberance over this. Uh, first of all, I, I worked with uh, Admiral Rickover in the, uh, the Pentagon and I, some years back, and I had an opportunity to see how his mind works. So it doesn't surprise me a bit that he was 20 years or 30 years ahead of his time. Uh, cellulosic uh, ethanol is an opportunity for the future. Uh, there's a lot of research going on at the present time to uh, determine how to break uh, cellulose as well as lignin, for that matter, and to do it economically uh, through uh, better enzymes and through uh, better uh, bacteria strains to convert uh, cellulose to, to starch to, to alcohol. Um, I think the... Um, the hidden challenge is water. Uh, this nation is going to be challenged uh, uh, for, for water supply, and you can't produce ethanol without water. And so the idea that you can go into the grasslands and suddenly uh, set up huge factories to uh, produce cellulosic uh, ethanol or, or even uh, corn-derived fermented al alcohol, I think um, is a little bit too optimistic unless you can figure out how to pipe water to the uh, production facilities. So I, uh, my feeling is that uh, Michigan is probably in a very good position <laughs> as compared with, uh, <laughs> say, South Dakota. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. McNerney, Inspector. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ellers. Uh, I want to commend the board. I spent my career, I, I'm a new member of Congress, and I spent my career in the research and development area, and I've always been impressed with uh, the National Science Foundation, the sorts of projects that are funded, how efficiently they work, and so on. So I think it's a very good operation. I'm, I'm proud to be on the committee overseeing that operation. Now, I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is a structural issue. Um, what specifically is being done to yeah. award, uh, in the merit review process, to award new researchers uh, as opposed to researchers with a track record of uh, publications? And in that process, how can we make sure that we're being fair to the more seasoned researchers? Uh, well, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we take a look at uh, what I would call market share, which is a surrogate for competition, competitiveness. And uh, when we see that uh, new researchers are, are garnering about 28 percent of the awards, the awards uh, that's good in itself, but it's been stable over a time when the um, uh, success rate has gone down, which means that we're now in a more competitive uh, time than we were maybe uh, six or seven years ago. But at the same time, we've been able to sustain that market share for, uh, for younger investigators. Uh, the one thing that I've tried to do is to uh, uh, put more emphasis on unsolicited grants because it's usually unsolicited grants where young investigators get their start. They build their research teams. They have a bright idea, perhaps an extension of their dissertation, but perhaps not. And I can report that um, when I came into the, uh, the foundation, the percentage of research grants that were unsolicited was a 71 percent, which means that 29 percent were solicited. Today, the unsolicited grants are up to 80 percent, and the solicited <coughs> grants are at 20 percent, which indicates we're skewing uh, the opportunity for these types of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, grant proposals from, uh, from young investigators. The other thing that um, you know, every young investigator has to go through uh, a learning curve. Uh, you know, they, when they first come to a university, they've got to set up a, a research group. They've got to uh, equip a, a laboratory. Then they've got to figure out what the first graduate student is going to work on. And then uh, usually the first two or three proposals uh, don't make it. <laughs> so they need feedback. Uh, they need encouragement and they need uh, mentoring in uh, getting up that learning curve. And our program officers are absolutely masters at uh, providing that type of guidance and that type of feedback. Um, but again, I get back to my <laughs> earlier point. They're, they are very much overworked. And um, uh, the more opportunity we give them, the better they can do that job. OK, I have a, an, a, an unrelated question. Uh, I did. I am struggling through the uh, report "Rising Above the Gathering Storm." In the in the, con uh, it's a it's a disturbing report, and I agree with the conclusions. Uh, now, our subcommittee was informed that only two of the eight division uh, directors and deputy division directors in the NSF Education Directorate are filled by temporary employees, and the other six positions are vacant. Now, I'm glad to see Dr. Merritt in the audience, uh, but. Uh, has that situation changed, or is there something that we need to take steps on in, the, in that regard? Well, the reason the situation has changed is because Dr. Merritt is on board, okay. and uh, she's uh, looking to uh, fill in those positions and, and to uh, develop her own team. But let me ask if she wants to add. Uh, those positions will be filled very shortly. Okay. All right, thank you. I yield back. We've been joined by the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Hall from Texas. I yield my time at this time. So thank, you. thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, Ms. Dr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier, uh, ranking member Ehlers had uh, mentioned his great esteem that he holds for, uh, for NSF, and I certainly uh, will concur with that. And good to see uh, Dr. DeMent and Dr. Buring both be here, here today. And I'll, I'll always hold NSF, especially in high esteem, as I always say to you, because I've applied for one NSF grant in my life, and I received it, so I'm always very happy with NSF. 
<laughs> and that was as a that was a dissertation improvement grant, and uh, so I am especially attuned to the importance of uh, nurturing young young investigators. But what I want to ask about here, going down to a lower uh, level in terms of uh, school school level, uh, I'm pleased to see the President's American Competitive Initiative proposes doubling the research budgets, but the education budget is getting a much smaller increase. And we continue to see with the latest NAEP results, uh, problems that high school students are having, 40% scoring below basic math level. Uh, but we're not seeing the increases or we're seeing decreases in uh, the funding for education and at NSF. Now, how is NSF going to accomplish the goal of reversing these trends and educating more, bringing up the education level, science, math, uh, STEM ed in general, uh, with these underfundings in these crucial areas? Well, let me say, Congressman, that um, education is clearly one of our highest priorities, if not the highest. And uh, we work closely with the board on this issue. Uh, you ask about national needs and whether the Sci Science Foundation is addressing national needs. I can't think of a more important national need at the present time than, uh, than education. And here I'm talking about uh, K to uh, postdoc. Continuity all up the, uh, the learning ladder. Our focus is uh, pretty much in three areas. <coughs> Clearly one is to uh, produce more uh, STEM <coughs> educated teachers and also to uh, upgrade uh, content uh, proficiency of existing teachers. So teacher preparation and in-service uh, training is critically important. Uh, the second uh, major priority is to fill up the, uh, the pipeline to encourage uh, uh, students through better instruction, through more excitement in the classroom, through, through more uh, activity-based uh, learning through better integration of informal education with formal education so that uh, science museums and, and other uh, um, uh, and members of the media and, and even uh, communities can, uh, can be engaged. I, I, uh, excuse me, I, 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 do ap I appreciate all that, but are you concerned that in the proposed budget that there is not enough funding for education and that uh, perhaps NSF is in some ways being squeezed out of the uh, K through 12 education sector. Well, I think that's, uh, that's turning around. We do have uh, uh, the opportunity in 08 in our uh, math and science partnership to uh, award $30 million worth of new grants. And I think that came about as a result of the evaluation of that program. Uh, to show that it was uh, very effective in increasing both math and science proficiency. So we hope that's on a different uh, slope at the present time, a positive slope instead of a negative slope. Um, there are many other programs that we've uh, targeted because of their effectiveness. Uh, some deal with undergraduate education. But our GK-12 program, which is um, a program that um, makes possible graduate students going into uh, uh, the classroom in K to 12 uh, classes to serve as a resource base in uh, teaching math and science, uh, working with the teachers, working with the students. And that's turned out to be one of our most effective programs, uh, providing that role model in the, uh, the classroom. And m some of these programs uh, were not plussed up in uh, 08 because they're still undergoing evaluation and in uh, uh, at the time uh, the budget was being put together, we had uh, the uh, mandate from Congress that we establish the American Competitiveness Council. And the, uh, uh, the uh, sense of Congress was the program shouldn't be uh, substantially increased unle unless they had been shown to be effective through third party or rigid uh, evaluation. Uh, some of the programs that were flat funded are undergoing evaluation in, in um, 08. Some will be uh, completed in 07. 
so that um, my uh, full expectation is that we'll continue to push on those programs and try and uh, plus them up in uh, future uh, budget cycles. But um, um, your point is well taken. We, we just have to continue uh, pushing on uh, the NSF role in education. If the chairman will indulge me for another 30 seconds, I just want to say I, I'm looking forward to the uh, National Science Board STEM Ed uh, proposal that will uh, that will be be coming out, uh, and I, I'm also interested. Maybe I'll, I will uh, follow up later about uh, what uh, is going on in terms of NSF with uh, nanotechnology and the National Nanotechnology Initiative. What, what NSF is doing, and also about the interagency hydrogen and fuel cells technical task force. What is going on with uh, with that? But I'll, I'll yield back right now. Thank you, Dr. Lipinski. Uh, Mr. Hall, prepared to ask some questions at this point. Yeah, thank you, and I'm sorry to be late. Uh, most of us, all of us, I guess, have other committees that require a lot of our time, and I didn't know what questions had been asked, uh, Mr. Chairman, until I could, but you're very capable of handling this, and I appreciate you and appreciate the things and your background. And Dr. Ehlers, of course, is one we go to, and he's really the champion of the National Science Board and folks that... Uh, are taking the leadership there. Uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bering and uh, Dr. Bement, I guess either one of you, uh, most of the K-12 education funding in the President's American Competitiveness Initiative, initiative is for programs at the Department of Education. And our committee has a, a few bills before it that speak to K-12 education at the NSF, uh, particularly HR. 524, which was a partnership for access to the laboratory science bill, and H.R. 362, the 10,000 teachers, 10 million minds, uh, math and science scholarship act. And I guess I'd ask you to, to comment on those bills, if you would, in, in post-hearing questions. Uh, uh, but for now, I'll ask that later. But what other role should NSF have with regard to the competitiveness agenda and K-12 STEM education? Uh, Dr. Bering, you want to go first? I'll defer Is there a to reason? Or you want to go second? I'll defer to my colleague. Yes. All right. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Hall, yes, for that uh, question. It's a very important question. The, uh, the funding provided uh, to the National Science Foundation for Education amounts to one-tenth of one percent of the total uh, funding that goes into education, K-12 education. So it's a very precious resource, and that resource, resource needs to continue to be focused on research and development because there's very little funding that is available for research and development in education to develop better methods, better instructional materials, better teacher training, and so forth. And that means that uh, at the end of, of our process, um, as we get into advanced development, we'll be able to show that these programs are effective, have an impact, can be scaled, can be transferred, and are sustainable. Those are the principal objectives of many of our programs. It requires effective partnerships with the states, with the uh, school boards, and with other entities in order to uh, hand that off and carry it into implementation. And that's what we spend a lot of time in our programs doing is establishing partnerships. The Math and Science Partnership Program is a clear example. In order to carry those uh, new methods and best practices into uh, implementation. And that will continue to be our approach. The one thing that would really uh, drain our resources is if we, uh, in, in any bill, were asked to really take on the, uh, the implementation role uh, because that's more than we could possibly handle with any foreseeable resource that we could we could be assigned. So I would, I would urge uh, the committee to uh, pay attention to some focus on education, research, and development, and appropriate resources for research and development in in these bills. Here to add to that. When we uh, come forward with our STEM Commission recommendations, I wouldn't be surprised if you will hear that one of the most important changes that is necessary for America is a revision of our attitude and commitment at the family and community level. As I've traveled around the, the country and the world in this regard, 
Uh, I'm struck by the fact that we send our kids off to school and forget them there, and the families and the communities are perfectly happy with that arrangement. We're going to have to reevaluate that. That won't cost any money, but it'll certainly wrench uh, the way we look at things. That's two good uh, answers. I like those. It doesn't cost any money, and it does but more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have one other question I want to ask uh, Dr. Bement. Uh, I don't think the committee plans to hold a separate hearing for the NSF uh, FY08 budget. So if you'd oblige me just for a moment to ask a few questions related to that. The FY07 joint budget resolution is favorable to NSF's research and related activities. This may have been asked uh, if it has. Uh, however, most of your other programs remain at the FY06 level. What impact will this have on the agency? And has that, have you asked that, Dr. Ailey? Has it? Well, it's a very good question. Um, obviously, we're very grateful and very excited about the increase in the research and related account budget. That will allow us to go forward with a number of uh, new initiatives. Uh, the two areas that uh, are still problematic for us is the EHR budget, as you've uh, indicated. If we look at the increase from 06 to 08, uh, there's a fairly healthy increase in much of the EHR budget, but it would have been uh, um, very uh, gratifying if we could have gotten uh, some attention in the continuing resolution for EHR. The other uh, part that is uh, strained at the moment is that we have all this wonderful money in our research account, but we didn't get any money in our agency operation and award management account. So already starting from a situation where we had an extreme overload on our program officers, we've only exacerbated that. Um, that's both the good and the bad part of it. I, th I thank you, and I think Dr. Early has already inquired about the industry partnerships, the parts of the language you like and don't like, and the drafting uh, recommendations. I yield back my time, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. We'll uh, have another round if, uh, if the witnesses are amenable for a few more minutes. Great. Then, uh, as the custom will continue to go back and forth between both sides. Uh, just a very quick thing. I don't want to take too much time with it, but uh, uh, Dr. Bement commented earlier about that uh, it's NSF's policy to allow but not uh, require cost sharing. Dr. Bering, is the board consistent with that uh, perspective that, that the allowance of cost sharing is supported by the board? Yes, indeed. Okay. That's good to hear because I think it's important. I, I, I fully believe uh, industry, which is coming to us through rising above the gathering storm and a host of other studies, is uh, pointing out that we need well-educated workforce and scientists. Uh, I think it's important that they play a, a participatory role in that process, and I want to make it possible, make sure we make it possible for them to do so. And indeed, while I, I wouldn't require it, I would encourage, uh, I think Dr. Bement's point is well taken, that not everyone can obtain such uh, a cooperation or co-funding, but to the extent that someone can help bring that to the table, I think there's a nice synergy possible, and it, it should be, be allowed. Uh, a, a question I've, uh, that emerges to me as I've talked to uh, some of the discipline-based sciences in, in some of the universities is, can we use the NSF grant uh, process for research to facilitate the, uh, the educational enterprise and the educational enterprise at two levels? One, educating more scientists per se, but also educating more science educators. And, and it seems to me there, there's potential for either um, Competitive, uh, competitiveness or comp, uh, complementarity between grants, and let me give the example. If we award a large research grant to an individual, does that possibly insulate them, depending on how we structure the grant, does it possibly insulate them from the activity of actually training new scientists or training science educators, or are there ways we can structure grants to incentivize those who uh, educate who directly involved themselves in the education of scientists. So I talked to one scientist uh, who said, you want us to start making sure we educate enough scientists? Tie our <laughs> grants to it. Uh, he knew where his bread was buttered, and uh, I'd, be, I'd welcome your thoughts about that. Well, I'm absolutely floored that that question came up because in our criterion two uh, for our grants, other impacts, that clearly is an area of focus, and we not only encourage it, but we expect it. Uh, not only that, but we uh, also require accountability. 
So it's not just a reporting on the good science that was done under scientific merit. It's also important that they report on how they fulfilled their promise in Criterion 2 as far as education is concerned. The other thing that I would mention is that um, a good bit of our education and research and education is really carried out by our research directorates. It's not just in ENHR. In fact, uh, there's a very close partnership of mutually leveraging um, education that can be supported by the uh, research directorates in bringing new content knowledge into not only undergraduate education but K-12 education. So we need to do a better job in our website to make sure the community really does understand that. So if, I, if two identical uh, grants were to arrive at, at the desk of, of the reviewers, uh, with the sole difference between them that, the, that, that one places explicit and greater emphasis on, on utilizing a portion of the grant to educate new scientists and to coordinate with the science uh, ed, uh, education activities of the College of Education, that would be looked on more favorably, conceivably. If every th all other things. Well, there's there is the question of whether uh, we would um, give preference in criterion two for education or for industry uh, coupling and so forth. The one thing that we have to be very cautious is that we don't use other impacts as a trump against uh, scientific merit, because the scientific merit has to be there and it has to be solid. Otherwise, we begin to tarnish our our gold standard of merit review. But uh, those things are all taken into account by our panels, and, and the chances are pretty high that they would be considered. We, we've yet to uh, address issues of, uh, in any detail today of, of encouraging and supporting researchers of diverse backgrounds, and particularly uh, ethnic diversity or economic opportunities, uh, and also gender issues. I, I appreciate either of you commenting briefly on that and what remaining time I have left. Uh, broadening participation has uh, been a high priority in the, uh, the foundation since I've, I've come. It's, it's in our priority list. It's in our strategic plan. It's, um, it's up front in all of our research directorates and research offices. They take that very seriously. In fact, if you look at the total investment across the foundation in broadening participation, about a quarter to a third of that is funded uh, through the research directorates and research offices in a variety of ways. And of course, that only provides internal leverage to be able to do more than we're currently uh, doing. So uh, I'm uh, pretty proud about uh, the, uh, the wide variety of programs that we have that are dedicated to broadening participation and the way we can integrate those to get more impact and more leverage. Dr. Bering, do you care to comment on that? I would certainly agree with that. I, I'm reminded of an experience I had while I was dean of the medical school at Indiana. Uh, the accrediting uh, commission came by and said, uh, uh, why don't you appoint a woman plastic surgeon? And I looked around at the time, and there weren't any. Uh, we've certainly fixed that issue. And uh, it, it was by, by way of first finding out there was a problem, and then paying attention to it in the way that Dr. Bement has described. Thank you, Dr. Bing. Dr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, just a comment. Several years ago, uh, several of us uh, in the Republican majority were successful in getting a bill through the Congress to uh, double the NSF funding in five years. Um, that eventually led to the present doubling plan, doubling in 10 years. Uh, many of the problems we discussed here would be solved by having some additional funding. So uh, I, in my mind, five years is better than 10 years. So let me challenge the new majority <laughs> to, uh, to try to go back to the bill we passed. And uh, I, I encourage you to do whatever you can to, to meet that standard. Uh, the other comment, um, we talked a bit about the young scientists versus the older scientists. Uh, I, I, let's take just a broader view of that. Years ago, I know that Europe was very concerned about the brain drain of scientists moving to the U.S. I'm starting to discern a brain drain the other way because of lack of adequate funding here and increasing funding in other countries. Uh, we have actually lost f ground compared to other countries, uh, several other countries who are uh, rapidly increasing their research funding. Uh, I personally know a scientist who 
moved to Europe recently. He was tired of struggling with annual grant requests and and uh, thought it would be wonderful to have a lifetime appointment with a guarantee of research funding. Uh, that's that's our competition. And so I just wanted to mention there's that aspect of it. Another one, uh, we, we make a great deal about peer review in the U.S., and I think it's excellent. But it's also very important to have peers. And uh, I talk, talked to a young scientist recently who was not, not at all happy. Um, because, and it was not just young scientists versus older scientists, but this, this person had a, a very good new approach, uh, was being recognized in the field for that, applied for NSF grant, and uh, was appalled at uh, some of the comments by some of the so-called peers who reviewed it, in which the comments indicated a basic misunderstanding of the science involved. Obviously, we're not familiar with it. And he was even more discouraged when he contacted the, the person in charge of that directorate and talked to him and found that he also did not understand. So I think a major chore is, is, uh, is not just worrying about young scientists getting it, but recognizing that many times the young scientists have new ideas <coughs> that uh, if someone's not been active in the research field for a few years, may have passed them by. So it, it's it's a multifaceted problem. It's not just young versus old, yes. and I think you can make good good argument for uh, for dramatically increasing the funding for young scientists. Uh, well, but also, I'm you have to have good peer review. Uh, even though there wasn't a question there, I do have um, some uh, opinions on those remarks. Um, first of all, in our our peer review process. In as much as we're emphasizing frontier research, we do try to include younger scientists who are pretty pretty well recognized because they know where the frontier is and they know what's important at the frontier and where the imp important research is being done. And that has um, um, that's been a very positive uh, uh, contribution in our panels and um, even our individual reviews. But we do have a uh, we do have due process within the foundation where um, uh, people who have been declined, investigators that have been declined can challenge the decline. And that goes through several steps of, of review all the way up to the uh, deputy director. So there, um, there are ways in which uh, someone who feels that they haven't had an adequate peer review can, um, uh, can get the attention of the foundation. Uh, you, I hope you also recognize that the reluctance of a new researcher about doing that and alienating uh, the, the leadership of the NSF. Yeah. I do indeed. How often is that actually done, Doctor, that someone appeals, a, especially successfully appeals a... a Well, it's not very frequent. <laughs> As uh, the deputy director indicates, she's only had one appeal that came up to her level as a final review step, appeal step, and it wasn't worthy of consideration, so it was denied. Dr. McNerney. Thank you. Um, as we've sort of been uh, talking this morning, uh, education is, is one of the issues that, that that challenges our country in terms of science and technology. Uh, and I think it's a lot of it is a cultural issue. Uh, many of the young people don't look at science uh, as uh, a profession or engineering as a profession that, that appeals to them. Is there anything that, that can be done within the National Science Foundation to sort of change that perception or attack the cultural issue that we're facing in terms of attracting young people into this profession? Uh, absolutely there is. Congressman, the um, the focus right now is introducing uh, science earlier in uh, elementary school, perhaps third to fifth grade, and even engineering for that matter, because that's hands-on and that can excite children toward uh, science and engineering and give them some early understanding about what these uh, fields are all about. 
the other thing that we can effectively do is try and work at the interfaces between primary and secondary education, secondary education, community colleges, and with uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, universities and colleges. And this is the continuity I was talking about because oftentimes a child will have a wonderful experience in an elementary school. Well, transition to a secondary school, it may be a trouble school or may not have ad adequate uh, uh, teaching talent in STEM education, and then it suddenly dissipates. It, it's a turnoff. Uh, the same thing between um, um, high school and, and college. So there, there needs to be more effective attention given to reducing the barriers and coupling preparation with expectation and uh, uh, entrance requirements at universities so we don't lose people from, uh, uh, from those pathways as they uh, move through the system. And that's where a lot of our effort is focused. Well, uh, in, uh, in my district, uh, there's some economically disadvantaged areas and I, I see uh, a lot of young people that aren't engaged in the process. Uh, and what I would suggest is that we find a way to, to make the science uh, more glamorous looking or engineering more appealing uh, because that's what it's going to take. We're going to have to go across those barriers to get people involved, uh, to make children uh, understand the, not only the, the practicality but also the beauty of science. Yes. And, uh, so that's my recommendation. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and this is where the business community can come in because we know that even in some troubled areas where the business community is not only committed but actually engaged and where they can provide release time for their scientists and engineers to work with the public schools, that could make a difference. Um, also, um, again, coupling uh, informal with, uh, with formal education can be a way of exciting young minds to uh, what science is all about. And um, uh, that, that is a very effective program. In fact, as I go to public schools, I ask people, uh, I, I ask the young children, do they know about the National Science Foundation? Only a few hands go up. But I, when I mention some of the television programs that we sponsor, almost all the hands go up, <laughs> which makes me feel very good. <laughs> Thank Dr. you, I, I yield back. Thank you very much. Our chairman uh, noted the relatively large contributions to energy that conservation could make, like buying a more efficient car and carpooling, as compared to hard-won contributions of additional energy from alternative sources, which reminded me of a very uh, interesting graph that on the uh, ordinate has satisfaction with life, how good you feel about your life. And on the abscissa is uh, per capita energy use. And if you can imagine that little graph in your mind's eye, we're way up at the upper right. This one person in 22 using a fourth of all the energy in the world. And there are 150 some countries and they polled each of these countries how good they felt about their life and they put a little spot on the graph. And uh, not too surprisingly, way down on the left side of the graph, uh, you have to have some meaningful amount of energy before you can feel good about your life. But that curve rises very steeply there. And uh, after rising very steeply there, it then approaches something of an asymptote that gets a little bit beyond where we are. But there are 27 countries in the world who use less energy than we, some of them uh, less than half as much energy as we use, who feel better about their station in life than, than we feel. And I mention this because as big as the uh, as the challenges are in the hard science areas, I think the biggest challenges for the future are going to be in the soft science areas. Uh, we're just going to have to get used to as a world, and particularly in this country, living with less energy. And that's going to be a real challenge in the soft science areas. Now, I come from the hard sciences and my personal training, but I recognize that in the future we're going to have really big challenges in the soft sciences. Is this a role that the National Science Foundation plays or do we need to look for another entity for leadership here? And, and no, Dr. Bartlett, it is a role that we're playing and we pay uh, a lot of attention to it. I might indicate that we do have energy initiatives in uh, hydrogen and fuel cell technology and advanced combustion. Um, 
other means of conservation, including um, renewable fuels. Um, and um, of course, uh, these are proposals that are sent to us by top ranked scientists who are really looking at the frontier of these fields and looking way, way ahead into the future. Um, but you're a, a point of um, uh, bringing in the, uh, the human factors associated with uh, energy production and energy use and um, also uh, satisfaction um, is a very important uh, component. I think one of the reasons why we probably are energy hogs but not as well satisfied as we'd uh, like to be is uh, because of uh, differences in productivity but also the fact that we work ourselves to death. <laughs> compared with, uh, with other nations where the lifestyles are considerably different. That is, that is a very rich area for, uh, for social science and understanding human factors. I'm glad you mentioned um, hydrogen and fuel cells in the same breath because as uh, you know, and I suspect not everybody knows, the hydrogen is not an energy source. It is simply a convenient way to carry energy from one place to another. And, uh, uh, of course, when you burn it, you get only water, which is not very polluting. But if we're really going to exploit the potential of hydrogen, it has to be with a fuel cell, doesn't yes. it? Because in the fuel cell, it's a great candidate for a fuel cell. In a fuel cell, you get at least twice the efficiencies you get in a reciprocating engine. Just burning hydrogen in a reciprocating engine doesn't make much sense. Well, you put your finger on it, uh, and you're absolutely right. You have to look at uh, net <coughs> energy uh, used which means that you have to take into account the, uh, the energy used in production of hydrogen. And if you're going to use energy, a uh, fair amount of energy, especially thermal energy or electrical energy and electrolysis in producing hydrogen, you better darn well get it back with a higher efficiency uh, engine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Bartlett, as always, insightful questions. I appreciate that, as it often comes from members of this committee. One final question, and then we'll adjourn. I'm very interested in the role of technical education, and particularly sciences, in the role of technical education. Uh, as I've talked to a number of our major employers back home, yes, they need top-flight sciences to do the, the high technology engineering and, and research, but they also need folks who can just work in a high technology environment, do such things as basic math, averages, scatter plots, the kind of things uh, that uh, unfortunately oftentimes our high school graduates can't do. Could you, either of you talk briefly about the technical education aspects of NSF and uh, what, what you see as future of that? I'm going to address it in a way that Dr. Beering can also uh, address it because coming from Purdue, I'm familiar with the outstanding technology program that they have. Oftentimes when we uh, compare ourselves with uh, China and India, we talk about the large number of engineers they produce and compare it with the engineers we produce. But oftentimes we don't include technicians and technician uh, training in the equation. And yet if you look at what those people do, our technicians are fulfilling jobs in the workplace very much like the engineers in other countries are, are uh, fulfilling. So we ought to pay attention to that. Uh, through our advanced technological education program, our ATE program, we have um, uh, developed partnerships with industry. About 90 percent of our ATE uh, programs with community colleges work in cooperation with the private sector. And the reason why those partnerships are critically important is that the, the private sector has the jobs. They know what requirements, skill requirements, uh, they're going to need not only today but in the future. <coughs> so those industry leaders are, are the ideal people and their engineering staffs to help structure the uh, curriculum for uh, these uh, uh, community colleges. And in all of our evaluations, we're finding that uh, that's one of the most effective programs we have in, in the NSF, not only in, in training top technical talent, but taking away the excuse in the private sector that we have to go abroad because we can't find the technical talent we need here in the United States. Uh, I'd like to see us get rid of that <laughs> through more uh, investment in our ATE program. Dr. Beering, any comments? Uh, yeah, we're going to speak to that with our engineering and also STEM uh, task forces very shortly. And I'd second what uh, Dr. Biment has said. Uh, the concern about the Chinese engineers, for example, 
uh, is that we haven't identified uh, who these people really are. They're mostly uh, technologists rather than engineers in the sense that we employ that term. So the, the differences are not as dramatic as they appear on the surface. Uh, another problem we have, uh, anticipating what you'll hear from our STEM group, is that uh, we do not welcome working professionals into the educational system. There are licensure problems and cultural uh, blocks, and uh, we need to do that. There are lots of retirees, for example, who would be delighted to come into the educational uh, curriculum work, and uh, I hope that we can get that done. I note, for example, I appreciate that Dr. Bering, neither Dr. Ehlers nor I would be certified to be able to teach in our respective disciplines at the right. high school level. And, and interestingly enough, on the vocational front, I know that some top flight welders, folks who've worked their whole life in welding and know it inside and out, couldn't teach, couldn't get a teaching certificate. I think we ought to look at that. I thank our witnesses. Are there other comments or questions from the panel? If not, then uh, uh, before we bring the hearing to close, I want to thank our witnesses for their outstanding work and for testifying before our subcommittee. This has indeed been a highly educational experience for us, and uh, our witnesses have given us a lot to consider as we proceed with developing and marking up legislation to authorize programs at the National Science Foundation. If there's no objection, the record will remain open for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well done. Thank you.